Welcome to another in our series of leaders interviews here on Rima, and I'm so grateful to have Marama Davidson join us in the studio. Hello, Marama. Morena, Andrew. Thank you for having me. I'm very honoured. Oh, thank you so much. And you arrived so on brand today on an electric scooter, like <laughs> commitment to the bit. I love it. It's just fun to be honest, and I have to be also honest that given traffic, particularly in Auckland City, it's actually a faster way to get around than a car. True. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, it's probably something we need to talk about in a bit anyway, because yeah, the whole idea of how totally. we approach public transport, totally. very fitting to many. How <laughs> how do you find the space to, to kind of blow off some steam? Because I'm aware, I mean, it's not unique to, to, to you guys across the political sphere in the last, say, few years. It mm. seems to be, has it been uniquely tough to be an MP in the last three years? It Absolutely, it has, that, than it has in any other term. But I have to say, I'm inspired by our campaign. And yeah. I know all of your candidates will have to say that, but I mean it. Like, that just keeps me going. I'm loving the support that we're getting. I'm loving the vision that we have for planet health and safety, for people to be well for the next generations. I have to say, it just makes me want to go out and tell everyone about it. Yeah, and you, I mean, you guys are uniquely positioned. As of right now, um, I saw a report that said you're on target to have the most green MPs ever. you've ever had before. Yeah. So what do you think it is about, say, this last election cycle that has helped you guys either do so well or maybe your messaging or other factors coming together? Yeah. And also we are defying political history, not once but twice, because all other um, instances of a smaller party in a government arrangement actually lead to the party losing their support. Mm. We increased it through 2017 to 2020. Mm. That defied political history. And now we've increased it again for two terms in a row. We have increased our support well above what we went in with on election night. And I put it down to being really focused on people and planet, quite mm. simply, um, and wanting to give people a vision to hope for uh, and our messaging just being really relevant to people's everyday lives and to people's hopes and dreams. Um, and I think the final thing is our incredible grassroots campaigning where, I mean, I know other political parties are literally having to pay people an income to do their door knocking and their phone calling. Mm. I am so proud that people doing that work for us, they're not being paid, they're volunteers, they're actually making sacrifice beyond just their time. Many people, I spoke to someone yesterday in Christchurch who heard my RNZ radio interview a couple of mornings ago and just off that wanted to get out of his house and come to a calling party for the Greens. So I'm really, I'm pretty chuffed with our grassroots volunteers. Mm, I think maybe if there is a, a positive to, I suppose, being one of the, what's been called, what, the power brokers now, I think they're yeah, calling you. Yeah. Right? No longer the minor parties with the power brokers. Um, but it does help you have a little bit more of a focused message, perhaps, um, in that, you know, you may not be able to set the entire tone of government mm. to say these are the things that are the most important to us. And, I mean, I would say you've been very consistent about that through the years too. But do you feel like maybe it is because of things like cost of living as well mm -hmm. have highlighted what people are feeling a little bit more, they're connecting with, with your message more more clearly? I think I think that's absolutely correct. We're the only party who has got a whole and costed plan that we could actually end poverty, especially for families with children, but that um, people on low and middle incomes will benefit from our plan more than any other political party. And at the same time, we are not going out there trying to sell to the people that the uber wealthy need even more wealth, especially at this time. And I think they're, well, I don't, I don't think, I know the research and the surveys are showing that even for the National and ACT supporters, even the majority of those parties are wanting the uber wealthy to contribute more. And that's a massive sign. So I think that's the sort of cut through that we're getting on the ground. Yeah. And uh, I mean, one of the policies that you talk about there is a, is a guaranteed minimum in income, right? Can you tell us a little bit more about what that involves? Yes. Yeah, so that is a $385 minimum guarantee for people out of work, people studying. It means that no matter what, when you are facing just ordinary life circumstances, you will be able to have the basics and survive it includes extra top up for parents with children. We highlighted just uh, the other day that we would also double the best start payments, which is the amount that everyone gets 
per child at the moment at $69, we would actually increase that to $140 and we would make it universal up to the age of three, whereas at the moment it's universal to one and then it's mean tested up to three after that. So all of this we know will make such a huge difference for people who we also know are just doing their best and struggling to be able to live a good life. That is unnecessary. People do not have to struggle in Aotearoa. We've actually got what we need. We just need to unlock the wealth and share it around the way it should have always been. And the question that tends to come out with these policies as well, right, is always around the, the fiscal realities of these things. Everyone's saying, how do you pay for your thing? You mm. can't pay for yours. You can't pay for yours. There's a hole here, a hole there, whatever it might be, right? Um, but, of course, you know, when we're looking at, at this one, the, the wealth tax has been um, at the forefront of your discussions of, you know, where we can access some of this this money. Tell us about the, the, the thinking behind that as well. I know there's some stats on, you know, how disproportionate wealth yeah. is allocated in New Zealand. So tell me more about that. So, for example, 311 families are holding um, $75 billion. That is more than the entirety of all wealth that the entire bottom 50% of the whole country hold. And so that is not just, that is not justice. And also those on the highest incomes with the highest wealth are effectively paying half the tax rate for people out there cleaning and bus driving and working in shops and keeping our communities running every single day. We tax people who earn, low and middle incomes particularly, but we do not tax people who own. And so those houses that are out there growing wealth for the few, they are not working. They are just sitting there and they are hauling massive costs from people who rent who are out there, sometimes two and three jobs just to cover the rent and the kai. We do not have to choose this for our country and the Greens are on track to be the biggest influence in government where we could actually get these solutions over the line so that no one has to worry and can plan with some stability what they want to do with their lives. And so, you know, something like a wealth tax would obviously supplement what we're already bringing in with other tax income and, and that sort of thing. And of course, tax is always a topic of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, one of the counterpoints to this that's been raised is that over the last few years in particular, the government spent more money than ever. Uh, and in fact, it's increased exponentially. And so the idea of, you know, all we need is just a bit more um, when we've already spent a large amount more than, you know, at any other time previously in New Zealand's history. Uh, what, what would be your response to that when we're looking to say, well, yeah, we're, we're almost there. We just need a bit more. And then others would say, well, you just need a bit more again and then a bit more again. Yeah, actually, um, the government has been trying to catch up on decades of underspending, particularly in key areas like health, climate change, poverty, um, uh, climate action, environmental protection. So, for example, under Jan Logie's leadership, my Green MP colleague, she injected millions, tens of millions of dollars into the prevention violence funding of grassroots organisations that had been neglected for 10 years. So when people say, oh, it's the most we've ever spent, people need to understand we neglected key services for decades and we are barely bringing that up to equity at all. It's not a little bit more, Andrew, it's a lot more. If we want to um, reduce the further expense down the line for climate action, we need a lot more to be able to support our farmers, for example, to cleaner and regenerative ways of farming, to be able to build up the public transport that we need so people have more choice how to get around, so people aren't stuck in traffic, and that will require massive investment as well. We've got dirty pipes and water happening. We've got um, beaches and rivers that aren't safe to swim in, let alone drink. We've got dirty old pipes that need fixing. We need a lot more, but we can afford it because the wealth that we need to fix all of those things is being held and they, the, wealth, the system can change so that the uber wealth only have to pay a little bit more. I have to say I was quite offended by Shane Jones on a debate I was on the other night who said to me, Marama, you cannot eliminate poverty by um, impoverishing wealthy people. I'm sorry, but they will not be lining up at food banks after giving an extra 2% more. What they will benefit from, though, 
are the safer and more cohesive communities and social justice issues that will also improve, like education, crime and health as a result. Mm. And so when we're talking about environmental impacts in particular too, one thing that I saw was interesting today, and I'd love you to unpack a little bit for Mm -hmm. me, is that um, I know there's uh, some thoughts now about how we can connect things like even say like the emissions trading scheme Mm -hmm. and things like that to provide direct benefit to New Zealanders as Mm -hmm. well. Because I do feel like sometimes... Well, I'll say for myself, I'll speak as a, you know, own this completely. Sometimes it's hard for me to connect. Okay, cool. Like there's this trading scheme thing over here. And then this is this problem with dirty rivers over there. Mm -hmm. And how do these things affect me? It just seems like it's a way of, I don't know, taxing this person for that person. I don't know how I'm going to benefit from it. So tell me again about about this, um, the ideas that you guys have been sharing very recently about maybe helping people understand how the emissions trading scheme could benefit them directly. Sure. So for example, we have a climate emissions reduction fund and polluters pay into that. Yeah. So we have to all remember that um, the big polluting industries have amassed incredible wealth and privilege and power, but they have not shared the benefits. Mm. And they have done so at the cost of our climate with massive emissions being spewed into our atmosphere. They have done so at the cost of our environment. Andrew, you have only one third of your beautiful rivers in this country that are possible and available to swim in. Mm. We should have all of them. Um, And when Auckland floods the way it did at the beginning of this year, we haven't built our communities to be able to withstand those weather impacts the the way that we could if we would invest and build properly. So those polluters have a moral responsibility to share around the resources that they grew at the expense of the many. Mm. Um, The climate impacts, the environmental destruction and inequality has been impacting on you whether you know it directly or not. And so um, making polluters pay for their mess to clean it up is, I think, something that many people would understand. And what we can do with that emissions fund is things like, and this is another green priority, um, uh, allowing for a grant and being able to fund up to $36,000 clean energy for your home so that they are cheaper to heat, more money in your pocket so that they are healthier and are not going to send your elderly and your children to hospital, which is what we are currently doing, um, so that you are part of reducing emissions because your homes will be run and powered by clean energy. We can funnel money to those who need it so that, because otherwise what is going to happen is People on low and middle incomes are going to bear the brunt, the impact and the cost of climate change more than those in wealthy high places who aren't on the floodplains and Mm. are getting their whole lives ripped apart, more than those who have got all the bunkers they need and all the emergency goods that they need because they can afford it, whereas other people can barely cover their day-to-day kai, let alone get up a storage of it. Um, So we have to funnel that back to the ordinary folk like yourselves who need to understand, wait, how am I going to benefit off that polluter tax? Well, first thing is you've already had to bear the um, harm of it Mm. in both social, environmental and climate uh, impacts. And secondly, you are going to have to bear the harm of it disproportionately trying to survive. Mm. Um, and so I've, I've heard some say, do. yeah, I've heard some say it's like the idea of uh, people being able to privatize their gains but publicize their losses. Absolutely. Right? So that um, we have a system, mm-hmm. and, and I think this is generally something we should all be aware of and concerned for that we you can, in some ways, uh, you know, even as a corporate entity or even as an individual sometimes. Mm-hmm. Do a lot of harm, yep. um, take a lot of income out of it. Yep. But if things go wrong, you can get the government to pay for it. You get the council to pay exactly. for it, right? And that's the trick. And this is where, when I hear policies that bash only some beneficiaries mm. without acknowledging that actually big corporations have been beneficiaries for decades, mm. um, and we have to really cut into that quite harmful narr- narrative that actually seeks to dehumanize the people who have the least voice and the least power. What I also want to say is those corporations who have amassed decades of wealth, decades of wealth, have also done it on the backs of 
um, low low paid work. And so they have required generations of a workforce to do the actual work, but they have not paid their workers in a way that has transferred wealth back to those workers in a way that those workers deserve. They have instead held the wealth. And so we have to recognise that there is no billionaire that gets there on their own. Mm. They use public services and roads and healthcare and education and justice systems. They use a workforce that they do not actually transfer wealth to. They get away with paying their workforce as little as possible. They wouldn't be billionaires without the labour and the generosity of the decorate decades of workforce that I have, that they have exploited, as well as the environment that they have exploited. Mm. And so um, when we're talking about how to implement some of these policies as well, and there's a few more I want to come back to in a moment, but um, you did prompt me to think too that when it comes to initiating these changes, um, is there a measure of maybe even, say, frustration sometimes when, uh, you know, so I look at uh, uh, coalition agreements between uh, the Greens and, uh, and Labour that you've never, you've never been an official coalition partner, mm. um, always been there for, you know, say, confidence and supply, mm. but in terms of, you know, being the official coalition partner, mm -hmm. that, that's eluded you up until now. And, you know, the way things are going for this election, maybe, you know, things will turn around. Maybe it'll be another, you know, say be, be three years in opposition. Mm. Uh, you know, how do you resolve the, the frustration that might be there too? Because I know, as you mentioned, Green support is very passionate people. Mm. How do you deal with it, something like that? By highlighting what we have managed to do over the past six years. So, for example, James, as climate minister, has taken more climate action in the past six years than any government in the past 30 years, that for the first time we have got a whole of country 25 year strategy to eliminate family violence and sexual violence and it is the biggest opportunity that we have had to make that change than we have ever had before and so many other achievements that, we're, that we can keep rattling off. Now imagine if the Greens had more power, we're actually at the cabinet table and that's how we are ins inspiring people to give their party vote to us because they have seen that. We've now got two, uh, the past two governments of experience of showing that we can get things done, we can work with Labour and get things across the line, but we can also hold our own independence and no other political party has been able to do that without thrashing their support right down to zero. Well, so you, you've, you've avoided the yo-yo effect, haven't you? That, um, I mean, we actually, we spoke with Winston Peters a little while ago and talked about, uh, you know, what his journey has been like with, you know, elected, part of government, now mm -hmm. kicked out and then back in, mm -hmm. might be back in a third bite of the cherry. Mm -hmm. How would you say, you know, what's distinguished your ability to do that versus, say, what's happened with... Uh, say New Zealand First or even other minor parties that have been, I think, Party, back to, Party yeah, for example. United Future going United back further Future. again. Yeah. Consistency. We haven't compromised on our long standing charter, which centres te tiriti justice above um, social responsibility, environmental wisdom, um, non violence, and a commitment to those with the least power um, leading the decisions that impact on their own communities. And those we've stuck to that for decades and I think people when they think about other political parties they sometimes have to um, scratch their head and go actually is that what they actually stand for mm -hmm. but with us we've remained tried and tested and true and I think people see that. Mm. Um, let's talk about renters for a moment too because this has been another big focus um, even you know prior to election season mm. and uh, the situation that renters find themselves in New Zealand the, the balance of power uh, and where it may or may not be. Mm. Um, what are your solutions for, for those who rent in New Zealand? Rent controls. We're really proud of the fact that we are proposing, and this is a very popular policy, we are proposing to limit the amount that landlords can raise your rent um, to either 3% or in times where um, inflation is really high, like right now, um, we would limit it to, uh, so at the moment inflation is well above 3%, mm. but it would be 3% or the lower of um, uh, inflation and um, wages, and so the lower of that. So never over 3%, but sometimes it could be less. And why that is, is because right now um, the power is held by people who own, and I think it's... Um, a third of the country who rent over over that for Māori and Pacifica, who are just being priced out of their homes, who are in unaffordable situations where the majority of their income 
is going towards rent, and that is not acceptable. It's not durable, and people are suffering because of that. While we massively scale up public, affordable, and community housing to actually um, clear the social housing register waitlist in the next five years, right now we need to stop the horrendous impacts that high rents are causing to people, and we would do that with rent controls. It's something that we've looked into for this whole term now, and we're really proud of going out there with that. And you're probably going to have a bit of a battle on your hands with rent control too when it comes to um, the economists that come out of the woodwork to say, you know, broadly speaking, speaking of rent controls, it's like a red rag to a bull, right? You mentioned red con- rent controls, and it seems to be um, economists – broadly fall into a no they don't work kind of category and, and I know you've looked at addressing why they would be different in New Zealand yeah. what what would be your response to those who say that when rent controls have been tried they have not been effective yeah that's just untrue and so where they have been unsuccessful is where the rent control is not comprehensive so for example in other cities and countries where only some homes qualify for the rent control and others don't, then you create this massive inequity. Our proposal will scoop scoop up all rental homes. Um, Secondly, the economists come back and say, oh, you're just going to um, force landlords to either sell up or um, you're going to um, make sure that they recuperate their costs in other ways. This is also why our plan comes with a massively and costed plan to upscale public housing as well so that we are not beholden to a, just a private rental market. And that's why ours will work. We've done the um, the research into where it has worked, where it has kept rents down. And those economists, um, they, they sort of need to get a little bit more up with the modern play and the modern analysis rather than keep reaching two models which don't equate to our country at all. Let's talk about public transport. As we mentioned, you put your money where your mouth is or your feet are, so to speak, in your uh, arrival here today. (laughs) There is a weird conflict I find in New Zealand. You know, certain issues are left or right depending on where in the world you are. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it seems to be for some reason that the public transport discussion Mm. um, seems to be a a left versus right thing. It's weird as. Isn't it weird? It's really weird. It's um, who... No matter what you think your political views are, who likes to be stuck in traffic? (laughs) I I, I don't know if I've found a human yet. And the only way to get more people being able to have less stressful travel um, arrangements is by improving um, public transport, investing in it, and also improving for safe cycleways and walkways. What I can say is adding extra lanes to big, big highways absolutely does not um, uh, bring us to decongestion and traffic. It actually, they just keep filling up. Now, Aucklanders can relate because we have seen so many extra lanes and highways and whole new tunnels even. Has it slowed, has it um, made your trip smoother and faster? You all know it has not. Because instead we need to be giving people more choices to travel, to get around and to choose to leave their car at home. And that will free up the roads for people who really do need to use it, for couriers, for people with disabilities, for mobility drivers. And the rest of us can choose another way of getting into work that's far less um, stressful and polluting and far healthier for our bodies and our minds. Mm. So um, I want to change tack ever so slightly because we did talk just before we came on here that it's, uh, well, eight to 10 years, depending on how you slice it, yep. um, for in you politics. being involved in politics yep. now. And um, for those who aren't aware as well, it's not like you had nothing else going on in your life before <laughs> you got involved. You're a mother of six children. Yeah, very proud. Uh, and two grandchildren now. Well, congratulations. Thank you. We love it. We absolutely love it. But you know, you cannot don't let anyone kid you into thinking that you can do this job alone. Mm. It requires a whole community. <laughs> it requires um, family support. Yep. My family support is my husband and our older children who have pretty much been helping to raise the babies for this past 10 years. And I'm just really, really grateful for my broader extended Fano and community um, who have been there. This isn't a sort of a job that you can pretend to be all macho and be isolated in your efforts. Um, You really need a close network of trusted support 
who you can um, share the burdens yeah. and the stresses with and stay healthy. Because you can stay in this job for a long time, but are you healthy? That's another question. Well, that's the thing. It does seem to take its toll, doesn't it, for, for those who maybe don't have that support. And, and again, I'm in, I'm in awe that you've been able to raise your, your family during that time. What was the conversation like, you know, walk me back, say, 10 years ago when you go like, all right, kids, mum's thinking about getting into politics. Yeah. Uh, how did that go down? They were so young, they didn't quite understand what the realities were going to be. Yeah. Um, especially my six-year-old, I think, sums it up well, the story that I have for her. She was six at the time. Uh, and they're like, yeah, mum's going to be an MP, but, like, what does that mean? Yeah. And then the first week that I was away for a whole week, and then I came back, and, you know, she was young and had been used to pretty much being in my hip pocket her whole life. Mm. And then I came back from my first week and I didn't even get in the driveway after after my taxi dropped me off with my luggage. I, didn't, I barely got in the driveway and this little angry face came mm. running across the lawn, jumped up and just wouldn't let go for probably a couple of hours. And the look on her face was like, what the hell do you call this job, you know? And I think um, she's she's worn that, understandable, oh, I don't want to use the word hostility, mm. understandable um, grudge about my job for this whole time. Um, and so it has taken me very purposeful discussion and care to keep her close as much as I can while I'm actually hard never in her life in a day-to-day -day way. It's taken me, I've had to go out of my way to make sure we stay connected in other ways. Mm. So, yeah, um, that's the sacrifice that people, I guess, won't know what it's going to be like for their family until they get there. But, again, it's only been because of an incredible family support that we're all doing okay. Um, so what if they said to you, Mum, we want to follow your footsteps? Uh, has that happened? Oh, I, I think they'd run 100 miles fast in the other direction. Um, <laughs> they're very much not into the to the public face of it all. Yeah. Uh, they don't want to be anywhere near me when I'm in front of media or public events, which I completely understand. They're they're all they they are all particularly shy kids. Like mm. you have kids who are who are all number of characters, right? All of mine happen to be painfully shy, and they didn't ask for this life. But we manage the best that we can, and I try and I've. It took me years to learn how to be disciplined and give them my focused attention or not at all. So, yeah, it's um, That's interesting. I think they're proud, but I think they look at it and go, who the heck would want to do this? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's an interesting point though, that you made there, that idea of, you know, it's either full attention or yeah. not, right? Because I think, yeah. I mean, it's so easy to fall into that trap, right? I'm just going to read this text or this email while you're telling me about your day at school okay. or whatever it is. And then suddenly, yeah, it doesn't go so well. Yeah, sure. It, um, it took me years to learn that I was doing that, though, that I was distracted. And, and then you end up not doing a good job of anything. Mm. You're not doing a good job of, of your emails and you're not doing a good job of your Zoom call. And you're also not doing a good job being a mum and being attentive. So you have to make a decision. I'll do this now and then I'll do this then. Mm. And that took me years of learning how to do that, learning to um, have focused time and learning that my well-being depended on it. Like you think to yourself, oh, I'll just get all my work done and then I'll be better. You're never going to get all your work done. There's a waiting list of about a thousand hours more <laughs> that you need to get through your list and yeah. you're never going to get it done. Mm. So as we mentioned earlier too, you're likely to be joined by a bunch of first time MPs as well. Yeah. So, I mean, are you going to have a conversation like that with them or what's going to be said to those guys? We've been having ongoing conversations as we get nearer and nearer to the reality of more and more of them come in and I'm sort of like, oh, um, are you ready? And then we have another poll where we've gone up again and I'm like, uh, <laughs> uh, so you, are you, you know? Yeah. So um, we've been having those conversations quite deeply with with different candidates from time to time. People have got children and families and other things in their lives. There is nothing, though, that can prepare you for the actual reality until you get there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, with the last few moments that we have together, I've got a couple of quick, quick questions we've asked to everybody who's come through these doors, mm -hmm. so you can take as much time as you like to sure. responding to these. But first of all, um, do we have a problem with free speech in New Zealand? Um, no, I wish we actually did have free speech. There are some people who have been um, disempowered for their free speech for a long, long time, like my grandmother who had her language beaten out of her. Um, like if that isn't against free speech, I don't know what is. So I wish we had 
equality in free speech, not just those with the power. Would you change anything about the current abortion laws in New Zealand? No, um, we've always been clear that abortion is um, a right for that person to make that decision and needs to be seen as a healthcare approach. How would you rebuild trust in government? Uh, through community grassroots work um, and through respected people in the communities, like we saw through the um, COVID vaccination and health work, it was our leaders in the community who had the most success in being able to share a message of protecting our whakapapa, and that's why we take the vaccinations. Um, our government leaders were never going to be able to get through, but our community leaders can. And lastly, why should a Christian vote for the Greens? Because I know that Jesus cared about sharing wealth and sharing justice, that making sure that all people were respected for who they were, that um, he was the ultimate in manaki and aroha, and he was the ultimate in humility and wanting to make sure that everyone could live good lives, and that's exactly what the Greens are proposing. I know too that all people, including Christians, understand that we have and intergenerational responsibilities to the people coming behind us to be able to hand them um, a God-given planet that is beautiful and safe and that we have protected the ecosystems and that is exactly what the Greens are proposing as well. Marama Davidson, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew.